Good morning. Welcome to All Saints Church. My name is Rob Graff. I serve as rector and I greet you all in the precious life-giving name of Jesus. For those watching online, we're glad you're with us. You're one of us. If we don't know you already, let us know who you are. You can email us at info at allsaintspaulies.org. And for those that are here who are visiting, um, please stop by the welcome table on your way out. We'd love to give you a gift. We'd love to hear more about you, so swing by that welcome table on your way out. There's uh, lots of good things going on in the life of the church that, uh, today. We're going to be welcoming some new members, welcoming them at all services. Praise God, all our services continue to grow, and it's because of you that we are reaching out, loving, we're making room for more, and that's always the sign of health, generosity. Thank you for that. Really looking forward to a, a service we're doing with the Abbey up the road um, on May 3rd, Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. We will be having testimony time and some worship in song. We'll, we'll pray together. We'll have uh, a time to gather around the table and have Holy Communion. And then we will have fellowship. And I can't emphasize how important this is. This is a church uh, that broke off from us uh, back in 2012. And uh, it's been hard. We love them. They love us. We worked, we worked on forgiveness over the years. And now, by God's grace, we're stepping into real reconciliation. And reconciliation is different, isn't it? Forgiveness is something we can do unilaterally by ourselves. Reconciliation takes two. So join in the dance. If you're a part of this church family, come to the Abbey on the 3rd of May and join in this dance of reconciliation. Thanks be to God. All right, let's stand together. As we step into worship boldly, singing from hymn 182, Christ is alive. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. 
we pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
on this Sunday where we celebrate Jesus being the Good Shepherd. Would you pray with me? O God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is the Good Shepherd of Your people, grant that when we hear His voice, we may know Him who calls us each by name and follow where He leads, who with You and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. A reading from the book of Nehemiah, beginning with the ninth chapter, the first verse, which can be found on page 404 in the Bible in the pew. A reading from Nehemiah. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite, and you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea, and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land, for you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself as it is to this day, and you divided the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day, and by a pillar of fire in the night to light them, <clears throat> to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws good statutes and commandments and you made known to them your holy sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by moses your servant you gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst and you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them the word of the lord thanks be to god The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. 
If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just pray that your spirit would move among us. It would convict. It would encourage. We would hear from you. God, today we want to, as your word says, lift your son high. Because it's your son who draws men to him. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your revealed word that it can teach and instruct and encourage. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Today we're going to be, um, the message is from... Our, our gospel passage we just read in John chapter 10. Let me find my notes. <laughs> so it's from John chapter 10, and we're going to look at those first 10 verses. And today's message is, is in three parts. Um, the first part is two stories. Second part of the message is one truth. Now there's multiple truths in this, in this passage through John chapter 10. Um, today is Good Shepherd Sunday. And, and so that's in there, that Jesus is our good shepherd. He is who we follow. He is, takes care of his sheep, which is us. And so there is that theme of the good shepherd. Um, earlier, there was the theme in, in John of that he is the bread of life and the living water. But we're going to look at one truth. So two stories, one truth. And then the last part of our message today is, is two implications because of that truth. So very simple. Two stories, one truth. Two implications. And so for the first story, actually comes not out of scripture, but out of my high school life. Um, I was involved in a very nerdy and geeky hobby in my high school years. And so I was involved in this hobby called antique bottle digging. And so uh, this, this gentleman in my community named Mr. Fleming took me under his wing, me and another friend, and and on Saturdays, he would pick us up and we would go to these old woods around Delaware, farm fields and woods, and we would look for old homesteads, 100, 150-year-old homesteads that weren't there anymore, but would have a foundation, and then we would search around that area, usually about 100 yards from that homestead foundation, and we'd have these bottle probes because that tr they always have a trash pile 100, 150 years ago, and it would be about a foot or two feet under the ground, so we'd take little probes and try to find the glass, and then we would dig these bottles up. And that was my hobby during high school. And in fact, every few months we'd go to an antique bottle show. And they have those things. And um, I'm not going to say this, but in a few months, Columbia is having their antique bottle show. And I may or may not be there. And so this was my hobby. And, and Mr. Fleming was a contractor. He was a home builder in Milford, Delaware. So everyone knew Mr. Fleming. And so we would get to these properties. And just like most fields... Of, and, and woods of private property, you would have barbed wire fence, you would have walls, you would have big signs that would say, no trespassing, keep out. All these different things going on around the property. And to be honest, half the time when we'd sneak in there, I thought we had permission because Mr. Fleming knew everyone. So he would just nonchalantly go over to barbed wire or go beyond the signs to say no trespassing. And I felt very comfortable thinking that Mr. Fleming knows these people and we're supposed to be there and we're fine. But I'm going to be honest, on the other half, I knew we weren't supposed to be. Because those times that we'd go into those fields or woods, he'd be like, keep it quiet. You know, he would, and we would go over the fence and go over the, through the trespassing. And more than one occasion, but one I really remember, was we were, we were in the woods. We probably weren't supposed to be there. And I hear Mr. Fleming go, he sees us, get out. And across, like a couple hundred yards across the field is an old farmhouse, and this guy's coming out of the field towards us. And so we get out of there, we jump the fence, get in the car, and drive off. Um, so you can say, in high school, I was a juvenile delinquent um, <laughs> because I antique bottle digged in somebody's yard or woods. Um, we, we were innocent. I mean, and generally, we weren't trying to disturb anything. But the gentleman in that farmhouse didn't know that. He sees a wall, barbed wire. He puts signs up, no trespassing. He didn't want people on his property. And when he sees from a distance three men jumping over a fence into his property that clearly says, no trespassing, keep out, all of that, 
he doesn't know what we're doing. You know, we could be poaching on his land. We could be trying to bury a dead body. We could be doing anything in his property. He just thought and suspected right and generally that we would be up to no good if we were there. And that's the first story. The second story is very sim similar to that story, and it's found in John chapter 10. In those first six verses, because Jesus shares a story in the same realm of people being where they're not supposed to be. Of a man jumping over the fence. And so let me read this out loud in the first six verses. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the, of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee for him, from him for they did not know his voice of the stranger. And then in verse 6, this is a figure of speech Jesus was used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. And so we see a very similar story of trespassing, going over the fence. They're not supposed to be there. And we're going to talk about that story in just a second, the simplicity of that story. But before we get there, we have to answer the question found in verse 6, is who is they and who is them that Jesus is speaking to? The they and them is the same group of people as found in chapter 9. The they and them are the Pharisees. These are the religious leaders who thought they had the corner market on God. They thought if you live by their rules, their systems, you would have your righteousness. And of course, the Pharisees say they have already attained that. They're living this self-righteous life. And in the beginning of chapter 9, Jesus is walking through the town with his disciples. And sitting there in that town is there's this blind man. And everyone knows this blind man. This man has been blind since birth. And the disciples decide to have a theological argument in front of this gentleman, which is sad. Because this man has been blind all of his life. This is his plot in life. And, and these, they're having a discussion. Who sinned that this man has been blind since birth? Was his mom? Was his dad? Who sinned? And, and Jesus would not get in the woods or in the weeds with them. Instead, he sees compassion. And he heals the blind man. And he brings his sight back. Which is an amazing thing. But the issue is, is that Jesus did it on the Sabbath. And with the Pharisees and the religious and Jewish laws, that was a no, no. That made the Pharisees mad. How could Jesus do this miraculous event for this blind man on the Sabbath? He's breaking the laws. He's breaking our code. And they were infuriated with Christ for doing this. And then halfway through chapter 9, Jesus changes the illustration from physical blindness to spiritual blindness. And he shares with his followers and the people around, he says, when I came to this world and I spoke truth, those that say they could see, these Pharisees, the more I share truth, the more they become blind. Because of the hardness of their heart and their own pride and their position, the more I speak, they say they can see, but the more they become blind. And he says in the reverse, those who knew they were blind, those who knew they were without hope, those who knew they needed a rescue, the, Jesus says, the more I spoke, the more I opened their eyes to the truth. And then in verse 40 and 41, as the Pharisees are listening into this, here's what happened. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say you see, your guilt remains. And then he moves into that story of the sheep pen. And it wasn't a spiritual story at first. It was just a story that's just from everyday life in their culture. And he's telling the Pharisees, you walk around the countryside and you see this this wall that holds all the sheep in. And you know there's an entrance to that sheep pen. You know there's a gate, there's an opening, there's a door. And you know that's how you get into the sheep pen. If you walk by that sheep pen, if you walk by that sheep pen, 
and you see someone on the side or on the back end of that sheep pen, even if they look like a shepherd, and they climb over the wall, what can you assume? They were thieves. They were robbers. They didn't have the best intention for those sheep. And that's just a simple story. And then from there, he makes it spiritual. And this is where the one truth there's multiple truths to this passage, but this is the one truth I want to highlight today. It's found in verses 7 through 9, the next three verses. So Jesus again said to them, and this truth is said twice. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And then verse 8. All who came before me were, are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And so the central truth I want to share today is this. Jesus is the door. That pen of sheep is us. Jesus has gathered his people. He has pulled them in. And those sheep in that pen is us. We are his sheep. Later on, in that passage, and later on, it even says that Jesus is our good shepherd. He is our leader. He, we follow him. We know his voice. Every time he speaks, we, we hear him and we can follow him. And so he's our shepherd. But the central truth today, and within that pen, and with us being his sheep, and he is our leader, the central point I want to share is that he is the door. And because of that, there's two implications that, of that truth that he is the door. And the first implication of, of him being the door is this. Is that he is the only way to safety. He says, as the sheep come in, they come into the pen and they come through me. They come through the door and I give them protection and I give them safety. Look what verse 9 says. It says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, what does he say? He will be saved. Jesus is the only door for salvation and for our safety. And here's the funny thing about safety, especially in the world we live in America today. Safety is not a big deal until we don't have it. None of us woke up this morning probably and said, okay, did anybody try to break into my house today? You know, this morning while we were asleep. Did anybody try to break in? Probably none of us woke up with that reality. No one else woke up with the reality is, I hope I'm safe getting to church today on, on the street. Even though the streets are dangerous. I pray, no. Safety only comes to the forefront when we don't have it. And the reality is, is Satan has done an incredible job in our culture in our world to convince those who don't know him to convince them that they're safe and even sometimes in our own christian lives we can convince that we're safe without christ but satan's done a great job making everyone feel very comfortable but again safety is not our priority until we don't have it and everyone in our lives have experienced that time when we felt we were secure we felt we were safe and then the bottom drops out, whether in our physical health, financial health, health, trauma, whatever it might be, Christian and non-Christian life, uh, uh, Christian and non-Christian life, when that bottom drops out, we realize how fragile this life is and how much of a veneer that safety is around us. It, it comes back to that 2 Corinthians 4 where it talks about that we have this uh, treasure, God's glory, in what? Jars of clay, earthen vessels. And sometimes we feel our earthenness a little bit more than others. And Jesus says, the only true safety is through me. Everything else is a thief and a robber for your security. Only through me. And we do know that. And I love what this passage is saying. You know, every thing can be thrown at us. But if we're in Christ, nothing can steal our soul and our relationship we have with the Father. Nothing. Ephesians 
First part of Ephesians it says that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. If we're in Christ, we have been sealed with His Spirit until the day of redemption. We are safe in His hands. So even as Christians, if we feel fragile sometimes, sometimes we need to hear the truth that we're still in His hands and we are safe. But there is a world who's not, who does not know Him. And Jesus says, I am the only way to salvation. And I'm the only way to safety. And today, even today, even though we're on this side of eternity and we mess up, Romans 8 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Even today we are safe living in this human body because our redemption is taken care of. Our eternity is taken care of. And the second implication of He is the only door for our lives is that not only do we find safety, but we also find life. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And then it goes on to say, and they will go in and out of that door and find pasture. You see, Jesus didn't save us to be in a pen and to be safe all of our life and to be bored. He gives us the safety. And then as we live through the Spirit, as the Holy Spirit's living in us, and we get our directive from God and Jesus, and, he, and we're living through that filter of Christ and God in our lives, then he allows us to get into life on this side of eternity and experience real life, have life that we have a purpose, that we have true fulfillment, that we have true excitement, but it only comes through Christ. In any other way is a thief and a robber. And then in verse 10, Jesus does what he always does. He puts a fork in the road and he says, pretty black and white. In verse 10, he says this. He goes, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I came that you might have life and life abundantly or life to the full. And that right there says there's really no fence sitting in this. We either, li- we either have safety in- through Christ and our salvation through Christ, and we us- either have our life through Christ, or anything else is not of God, and is going to rob, kill, and destroy what He has for us here. We might have our eternity set, but what kind of life do we have here with Christ? And so, as we ask the Holy Spirit what to do with this in our lives. I, I, I think this, this truth of Jesus being the door could land on us in a couple of ways. And, and, and the first way is, you know, there might be some of us in here, you know, I, I would trust and I would pray that all of us are, are found in Christ in here, that we have given our lives to Christ. And if we have, some of us in here, that bottom might have dropped out this past month, this past year, and you might find yourself fragile. And that veneer of safety the world gives has gone away. I, I want to share with you the truth of God's word that you are in his hands. And that you are safe. Um, but what do we do with that when that, those feelings come that I just feel fragile? I, I was reading, um, I, I, was, I got pointed to this passage a little bit ago from Isaiah. And it's Isaiah chapter 61 and, and verse 3. It says, uh, to grant those who mourn in Zion, um, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. And, and this is the part that really kind of stuck out to me. The garment of praise instead of ashes, and the oil of gl- uh, garment of praise instead of ashes. The, I I'm lost my spot. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called the oaks of of righteousness, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness. You know, we know the truth that we are secure and we're safe in God's hands, but when we have that fragile as Christian feelings come across, what do we do with that? And I think this passage tells us, lift your eyes to him and give him praise and worship, give him thanks. I love how it says it's the garment of praise. It's a coat of praise. It comes over us. When I was a little kid for a couple years, I lived in Rochester, New York, and my mom would bundle us up in the middle of winter 
And we did have to walk uphill both ways for the school. And we would go and it would be snowing and it would be negative 30 out. And my mom, it would be freezing out and we would walk up to, this, to our school at Gananda. And my mom would put me and my sister, she put a big coat around us. And when we went outside, we didn't feel that negative 30 degrees, whatever it was outside, because we had that big coat around us. But did that big coat change the temperature outside? It didn't. It just changed us. And we're walking through some fragile times. I think the, the, the word points us to Christ. It says, how, give him worship. Remember the good things he has done. In Nehemiah, we just read that. And, you know, they're coming, the, the Israelites are coming back to God, and they're reciting their history. And if you hear their history of every time God stepped in with his faithfulness and just took care of them, the way we feel our security in Christ, and it's already there. The way we feel our security in Christ is, is bring him back, to, go, go back to praise on him. We recite the good things he has done. That's where the code of praise comes on. And that's where we find our security is in that presence, in that relationship. And then lastly, what can we do with this? For some of us, probably all of us, there is times that we let Others, things, ideas, jump over the fence. And in verse, chap, verse 10, it says, anybody who does not go through that gate is a thief, a robber, a killer. And for some of us, and probably all of us, there's things in our lives saying, God, I gotta, let, I gotta stop letting that thing get over the fence. Everything needs to come through, your, through you, through your door, through your, through your gate, through your entry. Let that be in our lives. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how clear it is. God, I thank you that you're not a cosmic cop, but you're our shepherd. You take care of us. You lead us. We want to give up and just follow and experience that abundant life that you always promise through your scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Looking to the top of page five in this worship bulletin, we give voice to our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole state of Christ Church and for the world. Lord God, we worship you and we exalt your holy name. We thank you for you are a good, good father. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who is our good shepherd. Open our ears to be able to hear his voice and desire to follow. For his voice will guide us, 
His voice will teach us, and his voice will remind us who we are in you. Lord God, we lift up your church here and throughout the world, that she would be a beacon of hope and healing to those who do not yet know you. We pray for the leaders of the church, remembering today our Archbishop Foley, our bishops Steve and David, for our clergy, for Rob, Skip, Thad, and myself, that we would be continued to be found faithful. We thank you for those who serve on our vestry and our staff and those who disciple our children, that you would bless them and grant them wisdom in their duties. We pray, we continue to pray your blessing and provision for St. Paul's Church in Greenville, South Carolina, and its rector T. Brown, for Christ Church in Merle's Inlet and its rector Eric Spies, and for Harvest Church in Simpsonville and its church planter, the Reverend Travis Abercrombie. And for churches in our own community this Sunday, we pray for the Reverend Don Williams and Pauley's Island Community Church. Bless them. And in the cycle of prayers for children in the children, churches in the Diocese of the Carolinas, we lift up Christ the Redeemer Church in Pendleton, South Carolina, and its rector, the Reverend Luke Rasmussen. Continue to bless the work of their hands. And for those who serve you overseas, this Sunday we lift up the Reverend Dr. John Schuler and Manic Cornea, who are serving you in the North American Missionary Society. We ask that you provide for every need and continue open doors for them overseas. We lift up our nation, Lord. We pray against division. We pray that your peace would flow throughout our land. We lift up President Biden, Governor McMaster, all those who serve in an elected capacity, that they may be found faithful, that you would surround them with godly counsel. We ask, Lord, in your goodness, that you would pour out peace on those who are anxious today, that you would pour out hope for those who are despairing. I ask that you would pour out healing for those who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit, and that you would pour out provision for those who are fragile financially. We thank you, Lord, that you do provide manna from heaven that you know each person's name and their individual needs. And Lord God, we thank you for the multitude of blessings that we have experienced from your hand this week. May we grow in lifting up our praises and gratitude so that that garment will fall down and be wrapped around us as a mantle. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe through your Son, Jesus Christ, that through him we may go in and out and live life abundantly as you have provided and prepared for us before the foundation of the world. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let us now confess our sin to a loving God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sin, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let's stand together we greet one another. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
As we are finding our seats, I'm going to ask our new members to come forward. We are receiving a fresh group of new members. Come on up and line up in the front facing the church family, if you will. And I want to remind folks, uh, come on up and make your way. We've had members join us throughout the morning, um, just, just so we all know and we're keeping track. We had Martha Williams at 745, at 9 o'clock, Jake and Jessica Bauer, Anna and Clayton Burroughs, Amy and Scott D'Angelo, Val and Will Duke, Don and Bernie Durden, Annette and Dennis Hudak, John and Shannon Hungerford, Will and Dee Jowers, Catherine Kidder, Megan and Todd Leventus, Tom Putney, Betty Scheid, Sue and Wally Zidane, and here at 10.30 we have Mike and Rebecca Blanton, Faithful Du Bois, Christy Ellison, Brian and Sassy Henry, Hal and Melba Riddle, and David and Paula Canine. And we can say thank you, Lord, for blessing us so richly. And y'all, y'all have your uh, covenant responses and church family, you have yours as well. It's a service insert. It's a little sheet of paper there. One side has reception and blessing. The other side has relational covenant. They're both important. But look to the reception and blessing side, if you will. You have a role to play. All right, guys. Have you turned to Jesus Christ and accepted him as your savior? Do you believe that God has led you to become a member of All Saints Church? Congregation, will you please stand? Will you, the congregation, support these persons through prayer and love as we make our common witness to our Lord? We will. Let us all join together and pledge our support to the purpose and vision of All Saints Church together. We choose to be lifelong learners of Jesus Christ, so thoroughly yoked with Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, that we live like Jesus lived and love like Jesus loves while helping others do the same. At this point, Beth will gather up the, uh, the covenant, little sheets that have been signed, saying we're all in, count us in. While she's doing that, if you would look down to the bottom of this reception sheet, Church family, let us welcome our new members. We receive you as members of this church. We welcome you into the fellowship of this body and support you in your walk with Christ. We say thank you, Lord. Y'all may be seated. Thank you. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Lord. Y'all, please be seated. I want to take a moment because I didn't get to preach this morning and I have a whole lot of words, just a whole lot of... But that relational covenant piece, this is significant, isn't it? And for those of you who weren't with us with the kerfuffle, as I call it, the church split, split I referenced earlier, we, um, we adopted this statement kind of in the middle of that painful season. We realized we weren't fighting well. And there is a right way to disagree. Church, will we have conflict? Yes, we will, because we are a church family. Is there a right way to walk through conflict? There is. The Lord knows us. In His Holy Word, He has told us exactly how we are to disagree with one another. So if you look at this relational sheet real quick. Pursue reconciliation in my conflict with others, seeking and offering forgiveness, and whenever possible, resolving the issues that caused our conflict. There's scripture to back that up. How about number two, practice forbearance, overlook minor offenses. Three, talk directly to each other, not about each other. How about four, edifying, uh, be edifying in our discussions about other people. Avoiding demonizing, avoiding slander, gossip, besmirching, talking people down, doing what we do from time to time. There's no room for that. How about five? Well, we know we're not going to keep this completely and totally. We're going to fall. We're going to stumble. So we help each other out. 
hold each other accountable. If we violate our commitment to this relational covenant, we can say things like, hey, let's just be quiet. We've, we've gone down a bad trail here. We're better than this. Let's bless. Let's encourage. This is important. Stick it in your Bible. Put it on your fridge. Let it be something that you refer to from time to time. Let it be said of us, the church in this community. See how they love one another? See how they bless one another? All right, we're about to move to the Lord's table. What a privilege to gather at his table. We come not as religious people doing religious things. We come as children grafted into a family, grafted into the vine, who are privileged to receive from the Father endlessly. Don't let this be the only place where you receive grace and love and mercy. Let this be just a, the tip of the iceberg as you're pressing into the love of the Father. Ushers will lead us forward. We can stand or kneel at this rail, filling it out from right to left. We receive the bread. If we desire wine, we can drink from that cup or gently dip the wafer in the chalice as it comes by. And if for whatever reason you're not receiving today, cross your arms over your chest. We'll know to pass you by with the Lord's blessing, but don't miss His blessing. All those who are baptized, all those who are covered by the blood of the Lamb are encouraged to come forward and receive. We walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. We know. 
great thanksgiving continues looking to page six the lord be with you lift up your hearts let us give thanks to the lord our god thank you father it is right our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you father almighty creator of heaven and earth but chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your son jesus christ our lord for he is the true paschal lamb who was offered for us and has taken away the sin of the world who by his death has destroyed death and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life therefore we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. For on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Hallelujah. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ. And bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ taught us, we pray expectantly. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
Holy Father, we thank you for the joy of belonging to you. We thank you for the joy of knowing your name and resting in you. We thank you for your nearness. We thank you that you feed us well. Praying together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.